Thank you for having me. You're welcome. Thank you for being here. So do you want me to talk a little bit about Tenable, the vision, where we're going, and then we can maybe open it up to Q&A? Would that work? Yes, that would be perfect. Awesome. So I'm going to put it myself in front. Um, so, so, so here is what, how we see security at Tenable. So Tenable, we started with pure remedy assessment originally, right? We started with Nessus and then Security Center, and then we kind of grew our offering. Our vision has always been that to maintain good security, you need to understand what you have, and you need to make sure that your systems are up to date, that they're being managed properly, that you, you understand what they're doing, and that you disable with unneeded un un services, et cetera, et cetera. Now, that's what we've been doing historically. Now, the, the world has changed a lot, right? If you look at what happened over the last 18 months with, with COVID and, 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 and before that with a shift in technology, we're really living through interesting times because you basically... Um, Oh, and I'm being told, by the way, I forgot to introduce myself. So I'm CTO and co-founder of Tenable. <laughs> um, so now that's out of the way. Um, but if you look at what has been happening over the last few years, right? A, the infrastructure, the digital infrastructure has never been so complex, right? I mean, basically, we now have data centers in the cloud and some legacy data center uh, um, uh, in, 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 in the enterprise. We've got employees working from home with their own laptops so or with company supplies, laptop extra. And, and not only as, so, so and, and when infrastructure is in the cloud, some of it is in AWS, some of it is in GCP, et cetera, and they use different services and, and things like that. And the, with that shift, there was a lot of changes, right? The velocity of change, has never been so high. So now when your infrastructure kind of can change programmatically, so it can really change in real time. You can have servers popping up and down. So methodologies have changed. You don't patch a server, you redeploy it when it's in the cloud. Uh, when you have an employee working from home, you're not going to patch a system the same way that you did on-prem because you can't send an IT team to fix things, et cetera. So it's never been so complex. And at the same time, it's never been so strategic for any company. I mean, we've seen it, right? Over the, next, over the last 18 months with so many um, uh, people working from home and using Zoom and whatnot to kind of conduct day-to-day -day business and sometimes connecting to the legacy VPN, but more often than not, kind of like leveraging cloud services and SaaS and whatnot. So, so we're seeing really a big shift towards, uh, um, towards this. So, it, it is interesting, and if you look at the role of a CISO, it has always changed. It has all, all, also changed a lot over the last few years because the CISO, when I started my career, which was many years ago, uh, I mean the CISO did not even exist, right? It was a security guy who reported to IT, and and basically his role was to say no to everything, and that was it. And now the CISO is basically has a very strategic role, right? He has to report to the board of directors. He has to explain. He has to talk about risk and not just missing patches, et cetera, et cetera. So the role has changed a lot and has become extremely strategic because as all the companies are kind of changing, transforming, evolving, moving to the cloud, adapting new technologies to kind of keep running, well, the CISO has to oversee all that. He is the one on the hook if something goes wrong. So a lot of changes. And at Tenable, the way we've been, what we see needs to, to happen is that it is many things. The first one is our mission is to answer one question, which is very simple, and yet it's very difficult to always get an answer. The question is, are we secure? Are we deploying things securely? Is the, our environment in a healthy 
uh, uh, state from a, a security point of view, right? And that's something we're working on with Lumen. We, we do it with, uh, which is one of our offering. We do it with uh, technology such as benchmarking. So we can look at your infrastructure, we can compare to others. And we don't just look at the raw result of, you know, missing patches here versus others, right? We look into many dimensions. We look at how, how often you scan the system, your, your environment. We, we look at how quickly um, uh, patches are being deployed or systems are being remediated versus others. And, and we can help customers really understand where they stand, right? Because the, the truth with security is that nothing will ever be perfect. And if they are, it might be perfect for like five minutes, right? Uh, because then somebody publishes a new patch and you have to do it all over again. Um, but offering a way for customers to compare where they stand is really critical. And, and, and we, we continue to invest a lot of resources to, to help them further, uh, um, to help them further there. The second, the second thing that we're working on is we help our customers make sense of the data, right? If you just look at Vaughn data, uh, when I started my, my career with Nessus, um, people would just scan the TMZ, really. So they would scan five servers, you know, the web server, DNS1, DNS2, which was nearly the same as the first one, but not exactly the same. Uh, mail one and mail two, and that was it, right? That was your external surface at the time. And, and that would be it. And so at the time, managing the data was easy because a typical Nessus scan would show up maybe three problems and you would fix them and go home and, and, and then you, know, you would have a sense of accomplishment. Well, now a lot of our customers rightfully are scanning the entire infrastructure. So the exposed attack surface, the internal servers, the internal workstation, et cetera. And so now we're not talking about three or four findings. We're talking about millions of findings, right? Now, the problem is that not all of them are equal, right? Some of them are critical flaws. Some of them are like nice to fix if you have time. So we, we actually are spending a lot of resources to help customers make sense of it. The first thing we did there is that we did something called VPR that we released uh, nearly two years ago. And the idea with VPR is that it's a way to score the severity of, of a vulnerability, but not based on what would happen in a lab with, against an attacker with an infinite budget who can try the, uh, an attack a million times. It basically, we call it pragmatic security, right? It's basically, it's okay, in real life, what's happening for this problem, right? Let's, for instance, if you look at an Oracle vulnerability, like an Oracle database, well, maybe on paper it's critical because you can expose, uh, because you can execute code, but in practice, nobody's talking about it. There is no public exploit about it. Um, there is no, uh, uh, last time there was a similar flow in that database, nothing happened. So maybe that shouldn't be the first thing you fix, right? But that uh, printer vuln in Windows that everybody's doing patches for, well, maybe that one, that one really matters. So VPR kind of helps our customers kind of see vulnerabilities in two buckets, if, if you will, like things that need to be fixed right now versus things that should be fixed as part of proper cyber hygiene. And, and we're continuing to work a lot on prioritization to really help uh, um, uh, our customers beyond just scoring, but looking at the criticality of the servers, where they're exposed, are they gapped or not, et cetera, et cetera. So, so you, you'll start to see more and more uh, uh, things thing there. And the last thing that we're working on is that with the cloud in particular, you've got a completely different workflow and, and you need the security team to talk the same language as your DevOps or SREs, whatever you call them, people, right? It's you, just enumerating a list of missing patches is not helpful, right? You have to think in terms of configuration of devices and 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 sending patches of whatever to kind of tell them to redeploy a server. You have to map deployed instances to a gold image and say, well, you need to just fix that gold image and redeploy it instead of saying you've got to deploy this hundred of server, uh, you, you've got to fix this hundred of server, et cetera. So we're working on that to really bridge that gap because we see increasingly an infosec team who thinks in terms of servers, assets and whatnot, and an SRA team, which is thinking in terms of resources and, and which get deployed for, in a fast way. So a lot of things to work on 
and uh, um, and uh, um, a lot of things to bring to 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 continue to equip our customers to really speak the language of the enterprise and not just the language of security. All right, that's kind of our vision in a nutshell. Um, that was the infomercial. Any uh, any uh, uh, let's open it up to questions. Maybe it's more fun. Yes. Um, let me check here the, um, the how? No, we only have, please, everybody, you can ask questions now. I'll start with one while we wait for the other people to come with their questions. Um, how did you get started in cybersecurity? So it's a good question. You know, I got started in cybersecurity really nearly by accident, frankly. You know, I, I, I like to say that I started I, I discovered computers in reverse because I started with, uh, when I was younger, I started with, with a Macintosh system, right? And at the time it was single user, it was graphical, so easy to use, but single user. And then I discovered Unix. And when I discovered Unix, I discovered the uh, um, notion of permissions and users being able to do things and whatnot, et cetera. And then I discovered the internet and the fact that you could talk to another computer remotely. And, and I always found fascinating the idea that somebody in, in, in South America could talk to a server in Europe and kind of like make it do things, right? And so, so that's kind of how I got there. Um, I was also very interested in network programming. So the two kind of like the two interests kind of merged together and that's how Nessus was born really. It was, project that was that was looking uh looking to work on that, that was actually my second question that how was Nessus born so it was born like so i mean i can give you the long project. version because it's actually it's more than that right it's it's Nessus was born so so I, after i discovered linux um and that whole notion of security I installed something called Satan on my computer. And Satan was like, it's a granddaddy of vulnerability assessment tool, right? It was the very first scanner, uh, which was released in like the nineties. And I was running a very esoteric version of Linux. So Satan was extremely difficult. It took me like three days to install on my system, right? It's, I had to install binaries, fetch binaries, which are not part of this. I spare you the details to remember it. So that was that bad. And, and you know, the, uh, uh, when I installed it and it, I got it running, I was like, oh, it doesn't do much. It's not that interesting after all. And I figured, you know, that system is unmaintained. Maybe, maybe I could do something similar, but I learned a lot from it, right? I learned to be self-contained, to not use a billion uh, dependencies and things like that. So there was a lot of, uh, um, uh, of design decisions which were made just just by using it and, and and as i said because i was interested in programming i was interested in networking and i was interesting in inter interested in security i felt it was a great project to 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 start and to compound all that it's a world of security in the late night i mean for those of you joining and not familiar with nessus it was released in 1998 so a billion years ago and at the time, the um, at the time the security community was not that organized. You didn't have something like a Vaughn database, for instance. Nobody was keeping track of all the very out there, right? So to keep yourself informed as a uh, as a defender, if you will, as a sysadmin or whatnot, you had to subscribe to a mailing list called Bug Track, which was like volunteer run, and people would just post advisories every now and then sometimes it was an advisory sometimes it was sometimes it was a zero day and the only way to keep track of it was to read that mailing list every day and then they would say hey there's a flaw in apache one point whatever it's because it's the 90s and then you would have to like run around and say oh do we have this installed and so when i did nessus one of the thing is that i figured hey we could automate that part right eventually and users should not spend their time on that mailing list and trying to figure if something affects them. We should have some software telling them you've got something. And so as part of that design, it was not only to kind of make it easier to install than Satan and make it more modern, 
but more importantly, the idea was that to um, to keep it self-updating so that you would install Nessus once and then it would get, fetch new plugins over the internet and regularly tell you that, well, something, you know, one morning it would come up and uh, it would, the software would tell you that it would be a good idea to fix your send mail server because it's, it's, um, it, it has issues. So, so that's how it, it, it got started. And, and now the funny thing is that, so it's one thing to release software, but it's another to make it live. And, and what was fascinating to me is that I worked roughly one year on Nessus um, at home and after school. And I published it on bug track. So I sent like a little email, an announcement. If you do some Google search, you could find it. Uh, I saw released it in 1998. And then I basically I took off for a school trip because that's what I would do. And then I came back and my mailbox was full of like feature requests and questions about future support and things like that. And, and really the community kind of like the uh, adoption, if you will, really kept me going, right? The very first version of Nessus was only a UI. There was only a UI. There was no command line tool. So that was the first command, the first feature request, like make it, make it able to run through the command line and not just, not just in, um, in a graphical interface. And, and, uh, um, and then you took off from there and it was amazing. And, and then, you know, I really thought that I would publish it and be done with it like maybe like a month after and here we are we're still talking about it <laughs> well that's good <laughs> that, um, so what do you think is the great challenge of cybersecurity today you know i think so there are many right um i think the biggest one is so for large enterprise, for large companies, the biggest one is because depending on who you are, if you will, like you have different challenges, but so the biggest one I think is communication, right? It's very difficult for a CISO or for somebody reporting to the CISO to talk in non-technical terms about security and make the rest of the company understand how, um, how are the state of things without talking about CVEs and overflows and things like that. And, and I think we as an industry have done a, a, a not so great job at producing reports that people can read. Uh, I, I think we, it's very technical and then end users like, need to do that. So that's the number one. And then the second big problem, as I mentioned earlier, is that with the shift of technologies, adapting the workflows, a way of thinking uh, of security people to really what's happening um, with the adoption of new technology. And, and talking again in the same same terms as, as USRE, DevOps, et cetera. So communication is, is really is a big problem. Yes. Do you think that the pandemic has helped users to be more away in other ways or, or way around? Uh, yes and no. I think we've seen, We've seen we've seen something. I think from an end user point of view, so non technical, non security. Uh, I think there's been a rise of awareness a bit because we started to see a rise of phishing attacks and things like that. And it turns out, not that many company got wiped out, right? Because because of like an end user clicking on an email. Um, so. Uh, yeah, I think there is more awareness. I think everything happening in the news right now is raising awareness a lot, right? So, so I, I think as a civilization, if you will, we've never been so cybersecurity aware, which, which is a good thing. Uh, I think the flip side of that is that with the pandemic, we've seen a lot of technologies adopted in a fairly quick way, sometimes recklessly, sometimes in a more controlled way, but like, you know, suddenly you have a large workforce and they suddenly need uh, workstation, thing like remote access, and we'll see longer term if, if we discover uh, um, side effect there. Yes, I think that's what we're all a bit aware of now, and everything going on and everybody being at home and the children connected all day. And it's a whole yeah. new world for everybody, <laughs> especially people who are not specialists in cybersecurity. Exactly. Right. And, 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 and of course, yeah. And, and to your point, like if you compound it to the fact that you've got work from home, you've got kids, you've got kids on Zoom, like 
as is anybody here attending use their work computer to join a Zoom class for the kids? Have they led the kids in front of the computer by himself for some time? And what did he click on? What? <laughs> so, I, yeah, I think it will be interesting to see uh, um, in retrospect, like what our stories have happened or have been avoided very narrowly. I want, I'm going to ask the, the people attending here to if they want to ask questions. I'll just say it in Spanish in case. Eh, por favor, si tienen preguntas, por, pueden hacerla en el chat. Yo las puedo traducir si sí, que no la pueden formular en inglés, pero no hay ningún problema. Pueden hacer todas las preguntas que, que quieran. So, I have another one. What do you think of 5G and cybersecurity? Um, you know, it's... So we'll see I, I think so when we talk about 5g and cybersecurity, you've got multiple layers right you've got what i find interesting with 5g is that technically with 5g each uh cell tower may be able to support many more devices than today as a result we could see a future where you know today when you buy like iot devices for your home you have to spend some time, a fairly a big amount of time to configure them, especially if you're not technical. You have to like spend a long, long amount of time to configure them so that they connect to your Wi-Fi network and all that, right? And with 5G, we could see a future where a lot of these devices just come with their own like SIM card and it's you just turn them on and they just work. And then you go to the cloud to configure them and, and whatnot. And if that's the case, then it becomes even more difficult to control which devices are out there, right? Because not that it's easy today, but at least they kind of use your infrastructure. And you know, if you change up your Wi-Fi password, at least you disconnect a few of them. Um, but yeah, it, 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 you would have your security camera, you would have your thermostat, all that. Being able to see or sense what's happening in your house, and some of them tend to do that in a not so secure way and be able to connect directly to the internet. So what happens then, right? And so, so that's what I find the most fascinating which of, of possible futures and, and security implications because really it means a lack of, it, it means we would give up our ability to control what's in our environment, right? And it's bad at home, it's even worse at the enterprise level because a lot of companies have a lot of IoT devices here and there. And so now you've got devices listening, um, listening to what's happening in the room. Like if you think smart TV, if you think cameras, you've got a lot of devices um, which can physically impact the company. If you think in terms of OT devices or um, or even your thermostat, really, and cutting the wire won't be an option if something goes bad. So. Um, it, it will be interesting. And then you've got the other layer of 5G, which is, well, do we believe the suppliers of the, you know, the whole Huawei kind of like thing from two years ago and there was a ban and whatnot. So I guess it's semi-resolved, uh, but it does beg the question of, well, if, you know, if, if a lot of the infrastructure is directly on the cell phone operator network, like how much do we believe, do we trust them? So big kind of forms there. Okay, and um, just my personal question, how far is the installation of 5G in front? Uh, it's, you know, it's, it's going to be in two phases, right? Because the first, so you've got 5G replacing your typical LTE uh, antenna. And here in the US, it's pretty much done. It's, uh, um, I mean, I live in New York City, so it does show 5G, but like in, in all the populated areas of the US, it's pretty much done. In Europe, it's kind of making good progress. But the second wave will be what's called the millimeter wave 5G, which really, that's the one that people want. That's the one which gives you like gigabyte uh, traffic. And that is extremely costly to deploy because you have to deploy many more antennas. That's the one which really, would be used by a lot of IoT devices. And I think it's still behind. And, and I think the operators themselves are kind of scratching their heads on whether, do they do that for free? Do they, is it part of a different subscription model? Um, 
it's uh, uh, we'll see. So personally, I would tell you it's been disappointing in a big non-event, uh, <laughs> at least where I live. Yeah. Well, one reads so many things, so it's nice to to you know, hear it from somebody who knows. Um, I also have another question. What do you think about uh, products being open source or being licensed? What What do you think is best, or what would you recommend, perhaps? Um, I, I think it's not necessarily either or. I mean, everything has a purpose, right? So Nessus started as an open source project. The reason we closed sourced it after many years is that, frankly, we were the only one, as a company, we were the only one contributing to it, right? So we didn't have the, we had a lot of users, which was great, uh, and users would tell us about bugs and whatnot, but nobody or very few people would contribute. I mean, nobody would contribute to the engine and we got very few contributions to the plugin. So you end up doing a product for free and you let competitors use it. And it was a strategy, and it is still today, a very strategic differentiator. So open source was not the right fit for us. Mm -hmm. I think that technologies, uh, when it comes to managing infrastructure, where open source does make sense. So it really depends on, the brick, if you will, that, that, that you're talking about, right? So, so we, and, and look, we, we at Tenable, we still release a lot of open source software. We've got a GitHub uh, repository. We, we publish a few things. It's, you know, if it's not a strategic differentiator or if it's something, that, you know, like, look, if, if tomorrow we invent a, uh, a better way to allocate memory, right? To, to make it faster in our software, it's, nobody is buying our product because memory is allocated a little more efficiently. <laughs> so it would be silly to not open source it, right? It's, it's a brick that we spend time on. It's, it's a sensitive layer in our architecture. So yeah, let's, let's open source that and hopefully some other users will use it and send bug fixes if there are any. And so in that case, is it. But if, if your whole business is to take your open source products and then maybe you make it 5% better by like adding something on top of it, uh, you know, you have to look at the amount of resources you put in, in the open source versus non-open source and whether that makes sense. Yes, I think we have some questions here. Uh, uh, do you think that, uh, that in Latin America as being a special culture uh, it could influence in certain kinds of, of uh, threats that uh, behave in a different manner uh, than in countries with uh, more uh, more developed countries. Did that make sense? <laughs> yeah, I think, so if I understand the question right, you know, a lot of countries have different levels of maturity and security and different levels of concerns, right? So you probably can't tell from my accent, but I'm from France originally. And I uh, um, and so I kind of watch what's going there, what's going on there, and it's interesting, right? Because in many ways, for instance, France is behind in terms of maturity, and and it's if you look at why, usually it's because the whole budget process for security is under IT, so it, it's still like it, it's not the same as the US, and and so and and ultimately budget is everything, right? And so. In, in Latin America, yeah, I mean, there are some things which are behind and, and, and which, which might make, on one hand, you could argue it makes the, uh, 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 the companies maybe more exposed. The flip side is also, if you adopt new technologies a bit later, they are more mature and you're not building on something which is brand new and has like flows left and right, right? It's people have methodologies developed and whatnot. So, We'll see. Yes, yeah. it's a non-answer, but <laughs> every country is different. Another question here in the chat. Um, what is the lesson learned from the colonial pipeline security breach? Yeah, it's it's a good one. You know, it's so you look at. Uh, I mean, the lesson learned is that the OT environments are not air gapped, and so you know. OT is operational technology. So that's basically the computers running your pump and whatnot in, in your pipeline, in your water, uh, uh, water cleaning systems, et cetera, uh, factories. 
And, and it, you know, it's, it's an interesting world. And we do have some, you know, infomercial. We've got some offering there. But the, the uh, so, so we're very familiar with the technology. What's interesting with OT is that a lot of these protocols were designed, you know, if, if you look at the history of these protocols, basically, initially, you had no computers. And you had, like, gauges and, like, big things like you see in movies. And, like, each of them had wires, the like copper wires going to the reactor or whatever it was. And, and then somebody said, hey, you know what? It might be more cost efficient if instead of having like a set of wires for every gauge, we kind of like coaxed everything together on a single, single uh, uh, cable, which could be ethernet. And so these things could communicate over ethernet. And instead of, instead of uh, reinventing the wheel, let's use the IP protocol to transmit packets, right? But it will never be connected to the internet. It, it's just the same protocol, but it will be our gaps, right? It's just to replace the copper wires. And so a lot of these protocols have been designed not for security, so they've been designed for real time, right? So you want to know the pressure in that, uh, you, you, want, you want to know the pressure right now. You don't want to wait five milliseconds. You don't want for, to wait for a key exchange, for a password to be rotated. If you need to know if that thing is going to blow, you want to know it now, right? So, so that's a constraint a lot of these environments are working under, right? Um, but eventually what happened is that things were not air-gapped anymore and things were connected. And by the way, it, it's this little like PLCs and whatnot, they're not that user-friendly. So what you do is that you put like a Windows computer in front of it to kind of have a little UI and you can reconfigure it more easily and whatnot. And same thing, you don't take care of that Windows computer because it's supposed to be air gapped. So now you've got a bunch of Windows XP's kind of managing your pump and whatnot. And it's okay because it's not connected to the internet. And then one day somebody comes in and says, well, you know, it's kind of like sometime I have to reboot that old Windows box. And by the way, a lot of these factories and whatnot, there's no real IT team on site. You've got, the engineers are like, he's a real engineer, like physical engineer. And, and so, and some of them know how to use a computer. So that's a de facto at IT staff. And so what happened in, in, uh, in Colonial in particular is that basically they've got remote access so that this engineer, if, this, if a Windows XP box need, needs to be rebooted at 2 a.m., that guy doesn't have to drive 45 minutes to kind of push a button, right? So they basically do the remote access. And then once they got access, it was easy to, spread malware because it's a bunch of Windows XP box. I mean, I say Windows XP, I don't know what it was on Colonial, but it's a bunch of unmaintained system. And the lesson learned is that, you know, OT in particular, so in, in that particular industry, the, 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 the way of thinking has always been, well, there's no need to patch if it's working. I don't need to patch my Windows system. I don't need to upgrade my Windows system. I don't need to upgrade the PLC. And, and look, I'm not criticizing. Like we, when you talk about upgrading your factory as a software, as a firmware, you, you're literally talking about like sending people home for that day or not being able to kind of push the VR, right? Because that's, that's the way it's being built. But we need to rethink it, right? And we, we need to rethink it because in absolute, I mean, these things are critical for the for, for, for the nation for the economy and so sometimes they have like you know some of our customers they deal with explosives and things like that and so so as part of the risk matrix they have like evacuation plan for, for the whole like city next to the factory um and we can't continue to live hoping that these systems are in a gap they're not right and and whether it's remote access whether it's somebody with a usb key which shouldn't be plugged it's a bunch of unmanaged systems running with protocols which are not meant for security, and and we can just hope nothing bad will happen to to, to them. No, that's a fast strategy. You just hope. <laughs> um, so I have another. And actually, so, 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 so yeah, I'll, yeah, don't worry. Before you move on, but so we two days ago we actually published on the Tenable blog. We published a. Um, we found. A security problem in uh, in in one of the PLCs produced by Siemens Electric, where basically you can you can bypass the authentication, right? You can just send commands and whatnot. And 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 we published a blog basically not not bashing uh, uh, 
no, sorry, it's, not, it's, it's with Schneider, Schneider, Schneider. Um, we didn't like blame them, but we published a blog basically saying, well, look, it, it really is time to rethink it. Mm -hmm. uh, look, is it normal that like, I have like a thermostat when like here, here, right? Is it normal that this thermostat can self-update without me noticing, without like missing a beep, uh, uh, a beat, but a, a, a factory which is uh, uh, critical, like is being left unmaintained, and that's not normal if you think about it. And so I think it's time to me, the lesson learned from the whole like Colonial Pipeline Act is, is the whole OT industry needs to address these problems and, and start thinking about identifying devices, keeping them up to date, find a way to keep them up to date automatically. The vendor should be uh, um, should be involved in that and, and find ways to update them without missing a beep. So. Mm, yes. Well, I have one more here. Um, how can we pr protect ourselves from the APT, the Advanced Persistent Threat? Oh, well, it's, well that's a complex one. Uh, well, if you look at the post-mortem on many of them. So, so let's leave aside for one minute the SolarWinds hack for, for one minute and, and I'll address it, right? Um, but if you look at most intrusions, most APT intrusions, nothing fancy is being used, right? They don't, the attacker is not sending a very complex zero day attack. They don't, they, they, they don't uh, uh, use flaws which were undisclosed. They basically go in with the assumption that just bound to be an unpatched system somewhere and they go from there. And, and so the very first way to protect yourself against APT attacks is to make sure your environment is up to date and not just the base operating system, but all the third party applications like Acrobat and all these things kind of running on this system. So that's the number one. Number two, if you look at what happened with SolarWinds, so SolarWinds is a different story because now one of your vendors is supplying you with software, which contains malware really, right? And, and that's really unheard of uh, in, in a way. And in that case, if you look at what that malware did, it basically escalated privileges. So what it did is that it's kind of like logged into the network and then it is your identity. And then from there is somebody else's identity and, and whatnot, and then it becomes domain admin. And when it's domain admin, it can push commands to basically anybody. And, and then for this one, you know, you need to have a good grasp on your Active Directory security because that's what these malware do, right? That's why we acquired, uh, we acquired a company last year called Alcid. They focus on Active Directory misconfiguration and security because that is what, it's, that's the number one target that both the high-end APT attacks are targeting as well as a very low-end ransomware uh, software, right? They, they both have that thing in common. They go after your Active Directory server because the ultimate goal is to be, be able to push a new policy and spread this way, right? Because then, then you win. And it's fairly easy to escalate privileges uh, unless you're really good at, at managing Active Directory. So, so um, if you do these two things, you raise the bar so high that it's, it's unlikely somebody is going to break in. Great. Hay más preguntas del público? Por favor, siéntense libre a preguntar cualquier cosa. I don't have any more in the chat. Everybody is very shy today. <laughs> yes, <laughs> maybe. Don't be shy. No sean tímidos. So while, while everybody is thinking about a question, uh, I'll talk a little bit about something which I really like that we do at Tenable. So we have a group within the research group called the Zero Day Research Group. 
And so we've got a bunch of engineers whose job is to um, dissect some software or some hardware and find vulnerabilities in it, right? Uh, undisclosed vulnerabilities. We do this, actually, if you look at, so, so the reason why we, 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 we started doing this is that we started as a company to find a lot of zero days by accident, right? Basically when a vendor, we release a patch for the software, you know, and as part of our job, we would kind of like look at what the patch does to try to find if there's a way to remotely um, detect the problem. And, and we would often find, well, not often, but every now and then we would find that the vendor did not properly fix the vulnerability, right? So there was another way to access it and whatnot. And, you know, we're disclosing the vulnerability to the vendor and all that stuff, it's, it, it quickly becomes a full-time job. And so we decided to have a, uh, a team to dedicate it to, to, to do this, report to the vendors of the flaws we find by accident and also find new flaws. And they've been focusing a lot on IoT devices and, you know, and, and mostly like the home IoT. So we don't do that to kind of like create a new Nessus plugin and whatnot. It's really, we've been spending a lot of time to raise awareness on all the IoT devices that you guys have at home, right? Because the security of these things still in 2021 is disastrous. It's really speaking of like avoiding APT that's the first thing you want to control because these devices, we actually give them too much credit, right? They can watch us, they can listen to us, they can control our uh, locks, they can do a lot of things and, uh, um, and they make it really easy to, to, uh, uh, to steal your data, or to spy on you. And, and the reason why by pure uh, chance it be, that research became important is that with the whole working from home paradigm, paradigm shift, it, it, it opens a whole kind of forms, right? Because now you work from home and you've got some shit IoT device kind of listening to what you're saying and you're talking about something confidential in the course of your work. And so should that device listen to you and who is responsible for it, right? So there's a lot of questions there. And, um, and, and I think we'll see what happens in the future, but it's, it, it, these things are fairly scary. So make sure you buy devices from reputable vendors and, uh, <laughs> and um, it's okay to kind of turn them off every now and then. Yeah, <laughs> I think that's a very good message <laughs> as, a, as a, in a family setting at least. Um, well, have you ever been to Chile? Have you been down here or not yet? Not yet, no. Uh, in South America, I've been to the other side. I've been to Brazil a bit. Um, but not, not Chile. No. I look forward to it. I mean, with the world reopening, who knows? Yes, yes, yes. Once it's safe again. So, yeah, I have one last funny question. What's your hobby now that... <laughs> What's my hobby? Um, you know, I, I, enjoy, I enjoy traveling, so that was my hobby. <laughs> um, and now it's kind of coming back. No, I, I like, uh, um, I, I, one of my hobbies is I read a lot about Japanese culture and, and all that. So I'm very much into that. So, so um, reading books about the history of Japan and things like that. So, so that was, that's one of them. And the other hobby I'm just taking right now is that I started to develop, uh, to develop again in, uh, on iOS. So using the modern, the very modern way to develop for, for the iPhone, which I used, I, I did one app for the iPhone, the Nessus app, uh, maybe 10 years ago. So shortly after the iPhone came out. And so it's interesting. And I, and I never had any reason to really do any new application myself because I've got people doing it. Um, but um, it, it was very interesting to kind of like get up to date and realize how much progress has been made and, and how easy it is these days. So I really encourage everybody here, if you want to code, actually it's a very good platform to learn coding, et cetera. So that's good. Okay, I have one last question here. Mm -hmm. What do you know about the technologies used in the mining industry and the management, the remote management of industrial trucks and their threats? Um, well, I, I know cursory, right? I mean, what I know is that 
it, it's a very fragmented set of devices. And we've got we've got a team dedicated to kind of work on that. And they're much smaller than me on, on this whole uh, um, topic. So usually you've got some PLCs involved for mining because it basically they're just some actuators so they just do things. Um, but what's interesting is that no matter what the industry is, it's, it's a very fragmented set of vendors. It tends to be outdated devices or like way past their end of life by the vendor. So vendors does not support them anymore, uh, et cetera. So that's situational. Or you've got the opposite, like brand new factories, brand new mining. So I'll be happy to put you in touch with our team if, uh, if that's your concern and, and, uh, and they'll have a much better understanding and, and of, of, uh, of, of this than, than I do. Okay. Well, thank you so much. It's been really, really interesting. Well, All thank right. you so much for having me. <laughs> if anybody else has one last question, otherwise I think we, we're going to wrap up. Something said beep. I'm not sure. What mm, it was. Because somebody has a meeting next. <laughs> <laughs> next meeting. <laughs> Yes, I hope the day, I don't know. Are we on the same time as where you're living? Is it also seven o'clock at where you are? Yes, yes. yeah, okay. it's, it's seven o'clock right now. Okay. Well, thank you everybody for attending until the end and uh, bearing with uh, my rambling. I'm available if you have any follow-up question, you can reach me on LinkedIn, you can reach a Tenable team uh, by email and um, we, Look forward to hearing from you. Okay, well, thank you so, so much for your time. Thank you. And thank you, Tenable, for, for arranging this for us as well. And um, yes, I think I'm going to switch to Spanish now, not to leave you outside, but just to give a few <laughs> okay. messages, if that's all right. Of course. Um, but thank you so much. Um, yeah, it's been just a pleasure for us to have you here with us today. So very interesting everything um, bueno eh, muchas gracias a, a Tinable que es el patrocinador de, 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 de la empresa de, de Renault también queremos agradecerle al resto de nuestros patrocinadores que es Tecnovan, Nastec, J Scrambler, Qualis, 0x Word y My Public Inbox eh, sin ustedes no podemos hacerlo así que muchas gracias a nuestros patrocinadores eh, les queremos comentar que tenemos muchas más actividades en el año de 8.8, de hecho hoy día empezó 8.8 Andina y mañana sigue, son dos días, así que si no están inscritos y les gustaría, es gratis, pueden inscribirse vía Passline, ahí están, eh, es la etiquetera de todas nuestras conferencias. Eh, Así que los invitamos, el próximo, la próxima conferencia después de Andina es 8.8 Sur, que va a ser el 29 de julio, la agenda está muy próxima a, estar, a subirse a la web, ya está abierta la inscripción, eh, luego viene la Junior el 4 de agosto, invitamos a todos eh, los colegios de Chile y del mundo, en el fondo se pueden conectar, así que si tienen hijos en colegios, que le podría interesar, tenemos una agenda muy, muy interesante para Junior, eh, también ya está a punto de ser publicada, y luego viene Las Vegas también, el 7 de agosto, Norte, 88 Norte, el 25 de agosto, así que la agenda está completa hasta octubre, 22, 23, que es en Teca, tenemos Brasil, México, eh, también eh, en septiembre, en noviembre, así que hay muchas fechas que puedan reservar <ríe> para, para, para uh, escuchar más sobre ciberseguridad. Y el próximo Club CISO, eh, que será en... No tengo la fecha. La fecha. Bueno. <ríe> Está todo en la página web. Tengo un calendario con absolutamente todas las actividades. Es en septiembre, eso lo sé. Yo creo que es el 15 de septiembre. El 6 de octubre. Perdón, 6 de octubre, me equivoqué. Eh, así que eh, vamos a estar enviando obviamente las invitaciones, así que no, no hay por qué perdérselo. Así que eso, un millón de gracias a todos por asistir. Um, esperamos que lo hayan disfrutado, esperamos verlos muy pronto de nuevo en nuestras otras actividades. Siempre nos pueden contactar vía todas las redes sociales, vía la, el mail que tenemos en la página web. Así que eso. 
Aquí tenemos la, la gente diciendo muchas gracias. But thank you very much. All the people are saying thank you very much to you, Reno, for your time. Thank you. I have one more in the chat. Oh, uh, okay. Sorry, we didn't get that last question. Anna. Okay. Mm, Anna says, industrial internet of things has been a trend in the last two or three years. What are the main challenges for organizations? Let's take this before we wrap up. All right, it will be the, the closing words. Um, I, I, as I mentioned, I think, so, so, so there is a big push to automate everything. Some, some people talk about lights out factories and all that, like really fully automated factories. And the main, which is an interesting trend, I think the big challenges will be to find a system to keep the factory up to date. It's one thing to build it, but maintaining it up to up to code, et cetera, and, and, and up to date is going to be a much, much more difficult thing. For the recall, there is a company I know of, I work with, um, and, and which, which work in the heavy industry, and they have a whole line which is still running under Windows 3.11. And so at this point, <laughs> Because they never thought about the maintenance, the upgrade of the system, right? They're like, well, it, it works. So, so why would we do it? And um, and so, yeah, maintaining it, keeping track of all the keeping track of all the uh, uh, devices out there, and not just the computers, maintaining them, having a team on site to maintain all that is is necessary. Thank you so much. Yep.